It is the world's most dominant economic power with an iconic concept that has made it the number one destination for most immigrants, the American dream. Douglas Eze is one of the two million Africans who decided to make it their new country and who was able to transform his life. Beyond the restless accumulation of material goods, the self-described wealth strategist and award-winning insurance agent is now climbing into the wealthiest 1% club of society. I wanted to learn more about wealthy families. How do they keep wealth in the family from one generation to the next? So I actually wrote a book called Creating Generational Wealth. An immigrant from Nigeria, he is now a top-of-the-table member of the Million Dollar Roundtable, an exclusive club for the top insurance people in the world. Well, wealth is basically, um, you know, that money that you're going to leave for your children's children. You know, because there's one thing, getting rich is one thing, and being wealthy is making sure that your family, your generations, they your name stays in the family legacy forever. At conferences like this one, Douglas often shares his personal story of making it in America. I've um, been in the financial service industry for over 20 years, an entrepreneur on a technology company and also real estate. The next award goes to Douglas Eves. Well, thank you so much. Everyone. When he is not invited to talk or receive an award, he uses the opportunity to expand his network, a word that he has quickly come to associate with his net worth. The first time I made a million dollars, I, mean, I felt good. But then I realized, where's the money? It was all in stuff. And then I had to say to myself, man, you know, if you keep spending the money, you're not going to have the money. And Warren Buffett, he has two favorite quotes. The first one is, never lose your money. His second quote is, don't forget rule number one. Never lose your money. You know, so I had to change my mindset and start teaching myself how to make sure that I keep every dollar that I spend, I pay it back with simple interest and compounding interest. A lot of people miss that part. It's called self-financing. So what then we try to teach is show people, even if you make $50,000 a year, $30,000 a year, I show them how much that money is valued 20, 30 years from today with an increase. And I say, you know what? Guess who else knows the value of your money? The federal government, the banks, the media. With eight businesses under his belt, Douglas's philosophy is simple. Hard work pays off. And when it comes to it, the cash value king, as he calls himself, uses his money to enjoy life and discover new hobbies. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So, don't mess with me, man. <laughs> According to a 2019 study by the Pew Research Center, one in 10 black people living in the U.S. are immigrants. 40% of all African immigrants aged 25 and older have at least a bachelor's degree or higher. Hey, this is Dr. Kolade. How are you doing? Dr. Akindele Kolade is a certified psychiatrist, principal investigator at the Kolade Research Institute and president and CEO of Cal Psychiatrist Services. He is also a successful serial entrepreneur and philanthropist. I'm originally from Nigeria, but now I'm practicing in the United States. Um, a psychiatrist, uh, first and foremost, and then subspecialized in child psychiatry and adolescent psychiatry, and also and in addiction medicine. So I'm triple boarded. And I also do research, clinical research for upcoming medications to treat mental health. So I have a team here uh, that works for me. We have mid-levels, we have social workers, so we have uh, nurses, and we have the front desk staff. In today's world, and my office, we're doing mostly virtual practice. Um, I'm consulting for one, two, three, four, five hospitals um, across um, America in different states. So we virtually see these patients in different um, 
locations and environments, be it in the hospitals or in the clinics or sometimes in their homes. And uh, virtually, uh, because in psychiatry you don't have to touch a patient, but with today's technology, you could basically see everything and know everything, just looking at the computers and prescribe medication or do counseling or do therapy, whatever you need to do to make them move forward. And that the medication is not working. Does she use melatonin also? In my practice, I've witnessed an increase and an uptick in people looking for mental health compared to before the pandemic. I we've seen an increase of over 30% above what used to be in, uh, in terms of people looking for help. Hey, uh, how are you? I'm good, how about yourself? Good, so what are we doing today? Uh, you wanna see if I can possibly get a refill? Okay, any side effects? No. I see a lot of uh, private patients, I see a lot of athletes, and I see a lot of patients through insurance companies. I see some pro bono patients that I do for free. Uh, everybody comes in differently, and it, that's what uh, we do, whatever it takes to move them forward from their, this condition to this condition in a good way. Okay, so that's how we go, and that's how we roll. 9 p.m., we meet Dr. Akin in a completely different setting. Tonight, he invites us right. to his brand new luxury lounge in Las Vegas. Hey, hi. How are you doing? Welcome, sir. Everything good tonight? Everything's wonderful, sir. Okay, let's go party. <laughs> Somebody asked me this. <laughs> How come a doctor is opening a restaurant? It's service. It's service for the people in many varieties, be it in medicine, be it in the clinic, or be in the restaurant where you eat good food, or where you dance, or where you sing, or where you enjoy comedy. All that brings about wellness and health in all of us. I own my own pharmacies since 2009. We work hard every day, we wake up in the morning, 6 a.m., and we go to work. But we also play hard, and that's the reason why we have Splash, for people who work hard and at the same time party. According to a 2021 article published in Kiplinger.com, the state of Maryland had the second highest number of millionaires in the United States of America in 2020. This is where we meet Adisa Berry, a decorated minority and woman business owner who came to America more than 30 years ago from Burkina Faso. Today, this self-made millionaire leads a successful electrical construction company with an annual revenue averaging $25 million. When I came to this country, my major was accounting. I got my bachelor in accounting and then I had a part-time job with a construction company and I worked for the construction company as a controller of the company for about 12 years. I noticed that many CPAs are not familiar with uh, construction accounting. And it's something that I had already understood very well in school, and I mastered it very well. So when we used to have CPA come in, I had to explain them about the construction accounting. And then I opened my own business and I was doing construction accounting. Then when uh, my business partner joined the business, he said, um, I, just, I know you want to do construction management, but my background is electrical. If you want, we can take that route of the electrical. I said, hey, any opportunity that can grow the business, let's go for it. And that's how we got ourselves into electrical business. Yes. In order to claim her place in this male-dominated industry, Adisa spared no efforts, even if that meant going outside of her skill set. I'm a women-owned business. I'm a minority too. So when you go to apply those kind of certification, they want to make sure that you at least have a good knowledge about the business. So how do you get it? You have to educate yourself. I was going to evening classes, you know, cutting all this wiring, you know, doing receptacle, you know, taking those electrical courses. I don't have to be on the job site, but I still have to do it. 
when I was uh, working at Faso, my teacher, he's like, you know what, let me tell you one thing. The definition of a businessman is somebody who takes a risk. The risk can be positive and the risk can be negative. And he or she is mentally prepared for whatever the outcome of that risk is going to be. Tell the story on you today. I never thought about being rich, but the first risk, opening my business, that's the first risk I took. And these are all temporary feelings. It's temporary. And I'm glad I took that risk. For most Americans, buying a house is often considered as one of the first investments on the path to building wealth. So I got a few condos in this building. I got some in this building too. And that building also. Every time one comes on the market, you have to get it very quick. If you don't, you miss it. Now I got addicted. I keep buying one after another, one after another. And then I refinance the house and get money to buy another one. Come to the green gate to the right, have a great day. Back to Las Vegas, we are headed to Dr. Akin's mansion, located in an exclusive gated community. We join him and his wife as they celebrate their son Ramon's first birthday. It is an opportunity for the celebrity psychiatrist to reconnect with the people who matter the most in his life. Dr. Kalati. Hey, Aaron. Yes, sir. How is it going over there? It's a big honor for me uh, to have my entire family in the United States come from every city to represent this the honor and to celebrate with me uh, Raymond's first birthday. I think what we're doing is probably way bigger than Raymond's birthday. It's a family reunion, which gives me a lot of blessing, especially coming out of COVID. Uh, we haven't, most of us haven't seen each other for more than three, four years. And to have them come with their children, far and wide, is a blessing, and I'm so grateful for that. My nieces are here. The best uncle, period. <laughs> he's genuine, he's caring, and he's always there for us. On us. Yeah, that's my daughter, Alexandria. What is your favorite subject? Science? Uh, yeah. Cool. Oh, okay. Ball. Okay. Science is good. That's how you get to be a doctor, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> For this important birthday, Dr. Akin did not skimp on the means. Exclusive party venue with a breathtaking view on Las Vegas, exotic meals and rarest wine and champagne for all. But beyond the glitz and glamour, Dr. Akin is most keen to show his son the love of a father that he craved as a boy. I never knew my real father until I was uh, done with uh, secondary school. I grew up in a village and that had no water, no electricity. And I grew up with my grandmother. We had to go to the stream in the morning to take a shower in the stream, um, little river, and then um, fetch the water, and come back home, and then you have your breakfast, then you go to school. My father at that time was the, one of the Nigerian ambassadors, but they were divorced with my mother. My mother remarried, so I had a stepfather. Back then, there were no emails, there were no Instagram, there were no Facebooks. And we had to write letters with the email, and it would take three, four months to get a reply back. And um, whenever I get that reply back from him, and that used to be my most beautiful month and year in life that my father actually wrote back to me. Okay, that's your face. Right there, the smallest one. It's gonna be big for you. Yeah. I never met my father until I was 12 years old. Well, my mother um, told him that I'm really, really very rebellious. It was about time <laughs> that we met. So when we met, um, he had remarried uh, twice. He said to me, the best legacy I have for you and to every of his children is education. After that, you're on your own. 
<laughs> and he meant it. Every word of it. <laughs> we Nigerians understand that education is a way out. Anyway, we value, we cherish, you know, we cherish education. Oh my God, so good is he? They always tell him. I'm like one of the hardest working doctors I know, and I know quite a few because I'm a nurse myself. We went to Europe and I ended up in a country back then called Czechoslovakia. I learned the language and that's how I went to medical school uh, in a foreign language. I learned it, I spoke it better than English then and graduated as a doctor. I went back to Nigeria. I was employed in an oil company to take care of uh, an oil rig of over 800 people. That's how my real business career started because it opened my eyes to what could be possible. And before then, I created the first program in Nigeria called Flying Doctors. So the governor at that time in Port Harcourt, I gave him the idea. He said, he, he, he could do what? He said, I will fly down to any part of this state that I've never seen a doctor give me the tools. The governor then gave me a clinic. A clinic was packed in a helicopter with two nurses and we flew around the state to places that we would land and you know, see people that have never seen a helicopter live, they've never seen a doctor live. They'll line up and they'll stay there for three, four, five, seven days in the village. No disaster. <laughs> Not that I was looking for one. It's a good day. <laughs> it is said that courage and resilience are two virtues the first immigrants in America carried with them. This is still true for those arriving today. It is also what pushed these African high achievers into positions of success. I came to U.S. from Burkina Faso in 1986, September 1986. My ex was living with, he was renting a room in the house. We were staying in that room and I was going to school. I had my daughter when I had only a, one year left for my school. And I was uh, struggling with my daughter, trying to study and take her to the babysitter. It was really a lot of work to do. I went through that and I graduated. And I remember when I was done with school, I would send my resume everywhere to companies or look at any employment. I don't receive any response. And uh, my landlord told me, uh, you know what, you need to take all these uh, African degrees that you have on your resume and take all the experiences that you have from Africa, from your resume, just leave everything that you did here in the United States. I remove everything. Thank you. Then somebody, a company called. I wasn't home. My landlord was uh, a, a white person. And uh, when they called, they heard the voice message. And then when I came back, he listened to the voicemail, and he told me, oh, somebody called. They really want you to, to, to call them back because they have a position for you. They have an opening. And I was so excited. I got the number the same day I called the company. As soon as they heard my voice, they said, oh, the position has been filled. Less than an hour, when did you fill it out? I didn't know what to do. I used to take my daughter to the park, and uh, this lady heard me speaking French with her. She like, oh, what brought you here in the United States? And I told her I studied accounting. She like, oh, you know what? We got to, um, I have two partners, and um, we have a business, but the business is really in my basement. We just starting up. We don't have anybody to help us with the books. 
And I told him, well, I have to take my daughter to the babysitter. I paid the lady $5 an hour. Oh, okay, so we can pay the $5 an hour. That company moved out from her basement. We took over a whole floor in a building. I always wanted to go to America. That's the God's own country. You know, that's where the black Americans have fought for, for freedom. So I lived in Canada until I was 23, and then I left and went, came to America through Seattle. I ended up in a DMV. I've been here ever since. So my boy that I came to stay with in DMV in Maryland, Virginia, he had an old car, you know, that he wasn't driving as much. So I bought it for like $500 or owes the Honda Civic. I paid $500 for it. And I started, actually that, was, that became my house for a little bit, you know, became my house while I was waiting to buy IHOP. So I'll go in the car. Um, sleep there. In the morning, I became friends with a guy that owns a motel, you know, the, the motels, you know, the manager there. I'll go tell him, hey, listen, you know, I work at IHOP, I don't have, I don't want to stay in, but can I use your, your rooms and just shower in the morning? You know, I just want to use a shower, have my stuff. You know, he said, okay, cool. So he allowed me to sleep in his parking lot in my car, and then in the morning I'll go and he open one door, I'll go and take a shower, and I'll go to work. So most of you didn't know that I was sleeping in the car. They didn't even know that. I saw a lot of people that worked at the same IHOP and the same paper route. They were comfortable. They didn't, that was like, they were fighting to become managers. I'm like, nah, I gotta get out of this place, man. <laughs> I won't be no manager here. I mean, I, especially when I saw people in the financial industry that were making money. I didn't know nothing about finance. I just saw that, man, they making money in this business, talking to people about saving money. I could do that. I didn't become superstar right away, no. But I, I learned, I had good mentors, and I'm a learner, I always like to learn. Just reading books, finding successful people, you know, that are open, because not everybody's open to talking to you. Some people you might have to pay, you know, which I did, you know, I paid a bunch of folks that I, I wanted to learn from. And some, some folks are just, they were willing to teach you, but you still got to be in their class, you know? You got to pay them to do that. And I don't mind investing to learn. In my business, we recruit other people. So some people have put invested money, you know, giving, and they just stab you in the back. They lie to you, they steal from you, you know? And you're like, wow, you know, I, this guy did all this and this guy still did that. But you just leave it for God and let God deal with them, that's all. One of the company doctors was with me at the bar one night and asked me, what's your specialty? I told him I'm a family practitioner. So he told me he's a physician, he's a general practitioner, he's a surgeon, he's a occupational physician, and he also has an MBA. So what am I doing here exactly? I said, you have five things? He said, yeah, I got all this, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's, they changed my life. And I resigned after a week and came to America. That I'm gonna be a sub-specialist in anything they can let me be. That's my life. <sighs> yeah. True story. It salted me in my country. decided to be the best so that nobody could challenge me anymore. Strong men cry. It's actually not a sign of weakness. It's a sign, it's a sign of strength. Um, because I have emotions. I'm human. I feel pain. I feel joy, I feel anxiety, I feel unhappiness. I feel blessed. So I'm not shy to shed tears for things that means a lot to me. Basically, told me I have no business being there. <laughs> so that was very insulting to me. 
So I made a decision in my heart that I, 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 I need to get there so that nobody would ever talk to me like that anymore in my life. In my medical school, psychiatry was my no go. I, I barely had a C to pass. I didn't like it. I did my three-month rotation <laughs> in medical school. I was good. But then I went back home to Nigeria. I find out that one in every five patients I saw had a psychiatric problem, and I have no clue what to do with them. And um, I felt ashamed. I let my people down. I do it. I want to do it. And that's how I ended up doing psychiatry. And when I finished, I got challenged like you did adult psychiatry. What happens if children show up and they have psychiatric problem? I'm like, oh, that too. Besides the fact that we not even up to 100, 200 child psychiatrists in America, I want to do it. <laughs> I went and did it. Uh, um, and I got child and adolescent psychiatry behind my back. Um, in psychiatry, you also have what is called addiction issues. And there's a fellowship in addiction. Um, I decided to do it again and put it um, aside everything else. And when I finish with addiction, then I find out that I'm not only a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I'm also an adult psychiatrist and also an addiction guy. So that completed the circle for me um, in that aspect. But then I went in and did psychiatric administration fellowship to be a CEO of hospitals. So that if I walk into a hospital, somebody want to hire me or don't hire me, I told them I know how to run it. I can prove it to you by my certificate. So I had all that then. After that, nobody has ever asked me for a resume, literally. I just have to talk to you. They ask me, when do you want to start? If making a difference sometimes requires courage and resilience, a giving back can also happen in the most surprising ways, like for Douglas, who literally gave away a part of himself. So back then, my ex-wife, you know, nice young lady, we were together for a while. She helped me with my papers. So her sister's husband, they applied for life insurance through me. So I gave him a coverage and everything, and then he got declined, but I also got a call from the insurance company that his kidney was failing. And when I heard his story, because his dad died at the same age, and then his wife was pregnant and they have three kids already. And he was 34 years old. So I'm like, okay. So I went without even my wife then knowing, I went to the Innova Fairfax Hospital and said, let me test and see if I could be a match for him. And I did, I went and tested. I wasn't a match. <laughs> even the doctor said, listen, they, you, you, you all don't match, but you know, it's 2% chance. <laughs> this will work if you do it. You're only related, you don't have any, you know. I said, listen, forget all that. <laughs> I said, at the end of the day, it's God that's gonna make it work. Right. It's not me. You know, so I did, and boom. As soon as we put my, put my kidney, cause you know, you have two kidneys, so you, one is work, working, the other one is just sitting around waiting so the one, <laughs> so they took the one that was working, and as soon as they put on him, boom, he started using it, started working immediately. But I, yeah. So my kidney lasted on him for about 10 years. The longest they've ever seen. Mostly they say seven years. I didn't even know it didn't last that long. If I had known the only, it doesn't, I thought it was gonna last forever. I didn't know it was only 10 years. They should have told me that. <laughs> so long story short, he's back in the waiting, you know, back waiting for additional kidney, but he was able to see his son graduate and all that good stuff, his baby, you know, so which is great, you know. When I came to US, I didn't speak any English. And uh, when my first child was born, my daughter, I got sick. And I was admitted to the hospital. 
and two women from the church took my daughter at the house and they were nursing her because they had young kids about the same age as my daughter. And I was in the hospital for a week and they took care of my daughter during that time. And they would breastfeed my daughter. They didn't even think twice to think whether my daughter I have any disease that my daughter got from me. They were nursing my daughter. I guess this is the faith. I was in a nursing home several years ago, and I was in there for several months. And I got sick, and I had to go to the emergency room and spend the night. Well, to keep my room at the nursing home, it cost $400, which we didn't have. And later I found out that Adisa paid that. And nobody else knows that but my husband and I. In fact, I didn't know it for a long time until he told me. And she's come through many times in our lives to support us when we've needed it. She's always there, one phone call away. My sister, she went to an employment office to collect an employment. She met this old lady daughter who went there also to file for unemployment. And then the two of them were looking at each other and uh, they introduced each other to And uh, they both said they're from Burkina Faso. So they exchanged numbers, and then she, she brought her mom to my house, and I cook uh, Africa, uh, I would fufu, like cornmeal with okra, and then the old lady ate it. And then that's how we started the cooking. So every weekend, I would cook for the whole week for her. The daughter would come and pick it up. And I've been doing that for about six years. She had a stroke. She had blood clot in her leg. They did a surgery, all this stuff. And now she's uh, under ventilator. So breathing tube and feeding tube, all this stuff. COVID. When I got it, I was in the hospital for eight days with no family member, just you in that room, in the ICU, and all you see is nurses come in, take your blood. So it gives you time to reflect. <laughs> Especially when you know you could die, you, could, you know, it's serious. So that changed the game, that, that helped me, you know, realize a lot. I was moving very fast, a lot of things was happening, success was coming. My mom got sick while I was in the hospital. She had COVID. So my fiance now, when she heard that I was sick, and then she flew in from Georgia and just took care of my mom while I was in the hospital, you know. 
because I've known her for a long time, known her for 11 years. So just even she wanted us to be serious a while back. I'm like, man, big. I'm good. <laughs> Especially, <laughs> you know how it is when you've been married before, you don't want to jump right in. So I'm like, let me. But I'm like, you know what? So this time around, we like had to, had to propose to her. Apart from the instant connection that we did have from the first day, I had never felt anything as strong. And to be honest, on that day, I knew that that was my husband. It just wasn't the right timing, but I, I knew that was my husband. The first day, I noticed he was, he'd be quiet in a corner while he's observing everything. Mm -hmm. He's usually very quiet. I could tell that he was very humble. Um, and then in our follow-up conversation the next day, he had told me about the kidney in, in situation. I just hadn't heard anything like that before. And as we carried on being friends and, you know, his brother's kids that he was going to look after, that just touched me that usually it's women that always want to do all those things. I don't know many men that do. And I just felt like that was special. He's very proud of what he'd achieved, but you can always still get the humble side of him. Yeah. Building wealth does not guarantee being happy. But building a happy family is generally the reason why, for people like Douglas, generational wealth is a big part of the legacy that one leaves behind. In 2010, 2011, I told her the story about, you know, I have this son in Canada, but I don't know where he's at, you know, and she took it upon herself to go find him. She said, she said, just give me his name, and I did. And she went and online started looking for him. So she called me one day and said, listen, I think I found your son. She said, let me send you what I have. His name is Kevin James Chukuka Mihan. So I gave him my last, my Igbo name, you know, when he was born. That was the only thing I asked, because they didn't want me, because his grandparents are Irish. So I was young back then, you know, I didn't even know that was my first time experience racism to the highest level. I sent him a message saying that I was his father's cousin because luckily we have the same last name, <laughs> so it was easy, right? And then I said that your father has been looking for you for years um, because there's so many people with the same name and no picture. So I literally had to go through everybody and just, and then he responded and he, and he was very excited. Um, to like hear from anyone who's his father's relative in any capacity. I united with my, my son, we talked, I flew him out, he came, get to visit, we went to different places. Now he has a, he's, on, he's doing his own business. He has a uh, delivery business and he also has his own son now. He has a, so I have a grandson and he actually named the son my last name, Eze. You know, and um, his business is called Is It Delivery? <laughs> yeah, so good kid doing his thing. You know, been through a lot in his life, but he's for through it. It looks beautiful. I like the fireplace there. Thanks. Thanks. You guys want water? My daughter, when she reached the age 15 and 9 months, she went and she got her driving license. She was driving the boys, you know, taking them grocery shopping for the sport game, dropping them to school. So I was focusing more on the business. This is the main level you're walking. This is study, dining. My and daughter is a designer and uh, she she got into real estate, she got her real estate license. Her brother joined him, and they're pretty much doing it together. And I'm very impressed about what they do. And my other son too, in the middle. I'm really uh, proud of him too. He's an IT designer. Uh, he worked for one of the big five uh, tech company. All the way 
there is going to be marble. That's an elevator. Hard work pays off, man. 1993, I was still in Canada, man, when this house was built. I was like 27 years old. And now it's mine. Not bad for a guy from West Africa with no college degree of living the American dream. <laughs> I never dream about American dream. I'm grateful that God really um, um, helped me and uh, he gave me that opportunity to realize and to live my American dream. To Raymond. To Raymond. To Raymond. I've never been an A student. I didn't tell anybody I was an A student, um, but I never gave up. I fall. I wake up and do it again. <laughs> I fall, <laughs> wake up and do it again. Which is different from repeating the same mistake over and over and over. But I learn from my mistake. When I fall, I learn why I did fall. I know there's more educated Africans in this country than in any other part of the universe. Please tell your story. Let's tell people what we do so that nobody would think that we are from a whole country because we ain't from a whole country. We have brains. It is time for us to just stop being timid and let the little brown boys and girls emulate you and copy you and be like you and become you and do better. And that's what I'm gonna teach my children and that's why I'm doing this. I just want to start something. No matter the size of their fortune or the color of the dreams, African millionaires in America are changing the narrative by blazing new trails and giving hope to many immigrants, a proof that the American dream is still alive and well. <laughs>